So a warm welcome to today's session and I hope that you all are doing really good in your life and uh, as we can see from the thumbnail itself it will be a short and quick analysis or a re-reading of My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. So clearly we have heard of this popular name from the Victorian times who was born in 1812 and died in 1889. And when we first get to hear about this author or a writer or a poet what comes to our mind so we are taken aback with the thought of dramatic monologues so clearly dramatic monologue is widely associated with this name robert browning and certainly we can associate this unique establishment or introduction uh, in the poem my last duchess as well so firstly we know of him being a popular poet of the victorian time and then we know that he has written The Last Duchess and which is also associated with the concept of dramatic monologue. Now his work is characterized by speech form where an individual poet, speaker, narrator patiently addressing to one or more people engaging either in a conversation or a dialogue or a discourse. So this is a very simple idea of a dramatic monologue which was established and quite prevalent in all of the major works of Robert Browning. So clearly uh, if I repeat it is again dramatic monologue is again a speech form where an individual speaker, poet, narrator patiently is addressing to more than one more than one people or probably one uh, and engaging either in a conversation or a discourse. So as an audience or a reader when we are reading his poetry in particular it becomes a communicative medium. So if we read the poem My Last Dishes, we feel that there is a communicator who is trying to convey his emotions out to the audience in a very clear and a very structured way. So there are these immediate responses that quickly gets connected to the speaker. So there is a, uh, a symphony of interconnectedness. So this interconnectedness with the poet or the narrator or the speaker's intentions with the reader's mind creates a very connection, creates a very communicative connection. So if we read Tennyson's Ulysses as well, we find a monologic conversation or narration there as well. So I guess this was a very peculiar characteristic of most of the Victorian writers, but relevantly Robert Browning emphasizing and structuring it in a more wider way, in a more significant way with the name dramatic monologue. Now, even when we read a melancholic or a poem that is lamenting about something or a some, some person, we see that we get to travel through the internal realms of that particular person's or speaker's mind. So the last Duchess presents a dramatic monologue as well, where as a reader, if we reread or constantly hover around what Robert Browning is trying to tell us, we uh, discover that uh, we, we are traveling through the mind, the psychological intention, the parameters of the Duke of Ferrara, that is Alfonso. Now Browning's other works like Pauline, Porphyria's Lover, Men and Women, Fra Lippo Lippi, Andrea del Sarto lays influence in the literary field much like My Last Duchess. So these have over the years allowed to form structure the succeeding era writers and they have been widely benefited from the study of Robert Browning's work. So certainly Robert Browning uh, stands even today relevant in the contemporary time with his wonderful, popular, influential and uh, accepted works of all time. Now, apart from the dramatic monologues, Browning presents historical, political and social viewpoints as well. So he amalgamates these elements like the historical views, political issues and monologic structure with, in creating a very infused, enclosed work. And with these, we also see the, uh, certain ideas regarding religion and uh, beliefs and attributes of human beings like righteousness, courage and wisdom that makes his work distinguishable from the other writers of his time. But gradually we study the poem My Last Duchess, we need to infer the symbolic importance and the historical relevance as well. So since we are aware of the fact that the speaker itself is a duke 
who belongs from the Ferrara and his name is Alfonso. So quickly we have to check uh, what was his historical background. Why is he being referred to? Why a writer uh, of the 19th century is referring back to a duke who belonged to the 16th century? Now, if we have seen the poem already, we see that the poem is preceded by the epigraph Ferrara. Now, what is Ferrara indicating? Ferrara is indicating to the Duke of Ferrara, who is Alfonso II, who was born in the year 1533. And at the age of 25, he married Lucrezia Medici, a 14-year-old daughter of uh, the Duke of Tuscany. So, when he was 25, he got married to a 14-year-old a uh, girl and uh, we see that he was ruling until he died in 1598 so this is a very uh, primary outline of the historic history of the duke of ferrara and then gradually we see that he was a very uh, rigid and a strict duke who had ruled over his palace and his people in a very strict manner and uh, even though he married somebody from a very uh, kingly uh, dignity but he always regarded Lucrezia as somebody lower from his own social uh, status or position. So he always considered his bride beneath him socially. And such was his nature throughout. And also he had taken a wide amount of dowry from the Duke of Tuscany while he got married to Lucrezia. So gradually if we move on to the poem, we will see the psychological uh, parameters, the nature, the characteristics of this particular Duke of Ferrara whose name is Alfonso and presumably he becomes the speaker of this particular poem, My Last Duchess. So the poem uh, takes us back to the 16th century uh, where we meet the Duke of Ferrara. Uh, Alfonso and now Alfonso becomes a speaker of the poem presumably and who is he speaking to? He is speaking to an emissary who comes to visit him in his palace but also the way he speaks to the emissary becomes a dialogue or a discourse between the reader and the speaker. So the purpose of the emissary to arrive at the duke's palace is to negotiate regarding the second marriage. So we can have an idea that the third last duchess uh, is his first wife who died out of a cause and then he wishes to marry after the death of the first duchess and in that uh, there comes a emissary and an envoy who willingly comes to negotiate on an amount that is charged or demanded by duke of Al ferrara that is alfonso so we see that there is another side of him which is uh, where, whereby negotiating with the emissary we find that he is uh, socially demeaning others and he still believes on the idea that uh, the bride's family needs to pay on best a, a large amount of dowry before he gets to marry her. So such is his viewpoint towards marriage. So now the conversation between the Duke of Ferrara, that is Alfonso, who is also presumably the speaker, becomes interesting. The intention of the poem gradually is introduced with the conversation between the Duke and the uh, emissary or the envoy. Now the question is who was the first wife and how did she die? Now, we are aware of the fact that the first wife is, even though not mentioned, but from the historical understanding, it is Lucrezia. And how did she die becomes all the more questionable even towards the end. So we see that Alfonso the Duke shows the emissary or the visitor a beautiful large portrait of his first wife or the Duchess of the Ferrara or the last Duchess. So the portrait was made uh, by a popular painter and when the duchess and this this portrait was made when the duchess was young lively and very beautiful so the portrait captivates the visitor as well and we see that while he is uh, describing the duchess from the portrait there is a point of there is a, a sigh of disappointment anger and a lack of temptation so alfonso takes him to the time when the portrait was made by the painter and begins to remember reminiscence of that particular time. Now this conversation between the Duke and the visitor 
could be seen as if he is not only talking to the emissary only but the readers as well and this monologue allow us to understand the duke's relation with his late duchess and also understand his psychology so there is both disappointment and anger he feels that the duchess beauty allured everybody and that it was for her beauty that she got a wider recognition and attention from all the people of the palace and that she also enjoyed such kind of attention so with this kind of references and detailing we see that the duke or the speaker suffered from jealousy and uh, as this monologue continues uh, we as a reader slowly begin to realize the chilling certainty that the duke could be one of the reason before uh, behind a duchess or lady of mines and also the lines where he says that he gave commands and all the smiles stopped together so there probably be uh, a situation where he could be one of the hands behind her sudden death and this closure disclosure of the dead doesn't really happen throughout the poem but this can be a suspect out as a reader so having made this uh, idea of suspicion uh, we see that there are certain questions and interrogations and arguments coming up and as we slowly get to travel through the mind of the duke alfonso we find that he is extremely arrogant egoist and ill tempered and through his the like the speaker's voice and the tone we see that the duke himself is a very dictatorial category he, he he likes to dictate over the people and certainly he loves to uh loves when people uh tends to listen to him tends to best out to him tends to look down in front of him so initially readers cannot associate with any moral judgment on one hand as a reader we show sympathy by standing by the loss of his wife and then how the way he remembers to the time when she was young juvenile senile and beautiful and lively and then travels through his desire of marrying the count's daughter on the second time and at one point as a reader we also feel detached uh, because of his cruel and jealous behavior towards the duchess uh, that probably led to her death and then we see the negotiation of the marriage where we can only think of him getting worried uh, about the negotiation and not to get married to the count's daughter and he is only worried about the huge amount of dowry dowry that the envoy or the emissary or the visitor has come to talk of so now clearly we become aware of the social and political power in the hands of this particular duke he is boastful of his own nature his power his social status and positioning and has no regards neither for his first wife nor for the daughter of the count whom he wishes to marry so certainly first we get to see that he is uh, roaming about in the palace and is having a communication or a dialogue with the visitor and he shows a portrait out that was hanging on the wall Uh, which takes uh, takes us back through his uh, remembrance that this particular duchess his first wife was extremely lively beautiful and she had enjoyed the wider attention of the people because she was educated she was a learned woman she had opinions and she was remarkably beautiful and also we see that there is a sign of jealousy where he feels that uh, he was unable to bear the beauty the attention that the a uh, recognition that she was gaining gradually in the palace and from the people and that is left uh, that is never disclosed out to the poem and secondly we are taken back to the time when this he is negotiating with the semissary the visitor as to what could be the possible uh, dowries that would please him to get married to this countess daughter so the monologue sets a soliloquy as well where the duke is able to present his thoughts out to us and we as audience get to understand in a very close way so on one hand uh, we see that uh, you know this particular visitor who has come out for the negotiation becomes a silent interlocutor who has been brought by uh, the poet that is browning to not take part into the conversation but to exhibit the thoughts of the duke so duke becomes the potential subject of the poem while the emissary the envoy or the visitor becomes a silent interlocutor who just plays a very peculiar or a very trivial role 
to enhance the part played by the duke and we also get to question uh, the duke's intention and suspect of him being the cause of the duchess early demise so there is something very unclear about this duke something that is very unobvious about this duke so on one hand we see that he is remembering his first wife and that he was a patron of lover of art and a patron of lover towards his first wife and after the gradual demise of the first wife he looks forward in um, uh, having a, a second wife and in order to please the envoy and the or the emissary his voice certainly shifts from a disappointment and angry or a boastful tone to a very impervious tone so within the short encompass of the poem the psychoanalytic confession condition perspective of the duke or the speaker is presented dramatically to which we call this poem a dramatic monologue so this is typical of browning's dramatic bent of mind so like a typical dramatic monologue some critical situation perspective actions in the life of duke is well presented now we see the duke's character of someone being self revealing self introspecting and self analyzing so through his conversations and ideas and opinions and a shift of change in emotions and mood we get to analyze the character remarkably all by ourselves so on one hand we see that the duke is a cruel mean minded vain glorious person and on the other hand he shows in a very impervious tone that he's also a lover of art and then we see how he shows the envoy the portrait of his last duchess which is realistic and life like so there are these certain a uh, certain shifts in the mind of the speaker itself and this is made more relevant with the first person narrative mode so this first person mode of the poem the my last duchess means that to pass the uh, thoughts and perception of the duke and understand what is happening in his mind what causes him this psychological shift what causes him uh, this emotional fluctuations and allow us to be the only people and uh, to uh, and to understand the mind of the duke of the speaker so the dramatic monologue created by robert browning relies on the tension between sympathy and moral judgment also we can see that the duke is presented with a very contrasting characteristics with his first duchess and uh, we see that the duchess was uh, someone very learned tender hearted generous broad minded who loved the recognition and approval from the people and she always was very lively she had this innate goodness in her and which is why probably people had a very positive mindset towards her but on the other hand we see that the egoistic duke of uh, ferrara that is alfonso couldn't bear the recognition that duchess received and and he thought of her being widely enjoying her uh, uh, her her beauty so he wanted her to love him and pay special attention to him only and which caused probably the death and the uncertain death of Uh, the duchess so we are not clear of what exactly happened from neither from the historical background nor from the last duchess poem but somewhere we find that there was a mark of jealousy and ego that the duke had on the other hand if we shift from the uh, uh the the time when he is having a conversation to the emissary we see that the emissary has been sent to arrange the financial terms or negotiation of the marriage that is supposed to take place and that is uh, he was sent from the counts's palace uh, so that uh, you know he makes all the financial arrangements with the duke and that he promises that every uh, Uh, requirements that he has set for the dowry will be met by them and uh, certainly we see that uh, he doesn't really focus on the wives or the or, or the uh, person that he is getting married to so probably the wives becomes an object orientation here so this monologue has made only clear to us that he treats the wives even the first duchess and the why girl he wants to marry further as an object so the agent become agent or the visitor or the emissary is only the listener who does not speak and as i have told that he becomes the silent interlocutor in the poem but uh, he allows slowly uh, to reveal the actions of the 
Duke. So clearly if we just uh, try to conclude by making the video not very long, we can say that the Duke reveals the uh, poet's intention in uh, coming out uh, to exhibit the ability to use the dramatic monologue form to frame an internal dialogue between the Duke or the speaker and that of the emissary. And uh, the Duke takes to the envoy but in effect only lays himself, his personality out to the audience and we get to know that how he compulsively confronts the enigmas of his past. So at one hand we are both sympathetic, on the other hand we are not. So there are these mixtures of psychological speculations that goes on on the wider perspective as a reader. So the poem's uh, singular voice of the first person narrative technique also works for us to focus attention on the Duke's character, personality, perspective, psychology and whatever actions he has done in his past and leaves us only for the judgment to make. So we could become, he's just becoming another index to the complex mind of the aristocrat. So this could be a probable uh, brief outline or a gist or a thematic understanding of this poem my last touches hope you had uh, gained a little insight to it if you want to know more about the uh, thematic structure the literary techniques the figures of speech and on the historical background and of the critics as review you can definitely uh, lay down in the comment thank you for staying in connection have a good day